I'd like for everyone to think for a moment about the value of human life. And does one person's life have any more value than another person's? The current fee-for-service healthcare system rations out care based on the patient's ability to pay. I believe this is unethical. It is criminal. 95% of the country is still functioning on this fee-for-service model. I believe everyone should be treated the same. Everyone should have access to primary care regardless of their ability to pay. Hi, I'm Dr. Fassel Syed. Welcome to another episode of Fassel and Friends. We're here because we believe everyone deserves access to quality primary care, and ChenMed needs physicians to take care of them. Tonight's topic is leading towards value. My co-host and moderator of the chat is Dr. Dan McCarter. Welcome, Dr. Dan. Hey, Fassel. It's good to be with you again. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, we need more value in healthcare in this country, so I'm looking forward to the, tonight's conversation. Oh, I am. I am too. Uh, tonight's tonight's friend is let's, let's just welcome Dr. Don Crane. Uh, Dr. Don Crane, sorry, Mr. Don Crane. Welcome. <laughs> Glad to be here, Fassel. Good to see you. Good to see you, Dr. Dan. Nice to see you. Glad to be here. Don, you have been CEO of America's Physician Groups for many years now. 21. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what brought you to APG. Well, quirks of fate uh, did in, in large part, I must say. Uh, long ago, there was a bankruptcy in Southern California involving Med Partners. I was the chair of the creditors committee. It was very association-like. My position in then CAPG, now APG, name change became open. They interviewed me. They made the terrible mistake of hiring me and they perpetuated that bad judgment for two decades. And so that's the quirk of fate. But indeed, I am passionate about the transformation of America and healthcare. That's what drives me. Uh, that's what I'd like to see accomplished. I know what opportunity lies before us, but I know what imperative is in our hands right now. We're not doing anywhere near what we could do. And there's some suffering that results. So I'm, there's your answer. I'm very passionate about transforming American healthcare. I, I, I remember in the pre-show we were talking, when I finished my residency training, I had absolutely no idea that there were different options with how you pay for med medical care. Like I, I always assumed that you just pay for every visit or any test. It's like you do like when you go to the mechanic. Um, otherwise, I mean, you just go to a free clinic for medical care. So how do you believe we should pay for health care in the United States? So we're, we've all become sort of, you know, uh, ec economists to a certain extent and yeah. e economic behavioralism. I mean, payment methodology makes a lot, a lot of difference. So you can pay people by the hour, you can pay them by the click, or you can pay them by the case, or you can pay them in advance as we recommend be done. This is our model. Um, and so we are very much wedded to the notion that a single payment is made for a defined population, very large, for a defined period of time, say a year, for a defined set of benefits. And that that is prospectively paid and it changes everything about care delivery once that's once that's done, but it's key. Many things have to be done to transform our system, but that's probably number one at the top of the list, Faisal. Yeah, well, we, we meet with independent, independent physicians across the country. And when, when they hear risk, you hear especially full risk, you know, there's so much hesitation. And the first, the first question is usually something along the lines of, well, don't you think we should just first figure out shared savings? And and our response usually is, well, no, you know, you got, you got to just do it. But how do you how do you overcome that that hurdle? Well, first you have to be have some humility and some sympathy for it because no physician shouldn't go to medical school to become insurance carriers, right? So the notion the word risk seems somehow foreign yeah. and so on. But indeed. In 2021, we are and must be stewards of limited resources. If we exhaust financial and other resources, 
it will equate to denied care. It simply won't be enough access uh, available for those that need it. So it now becomes part of our charter and our charge that we actually be stewards of the resources and um, you know, husband this money, et cetera, intelligently and not wastefully. Fee for service is wasteful, as I can elaborate in a minute. Perspective payment is not. And so uh, whether we like it or not, we've all got to pay attention to the payment model. It is it is indispensably important. Now, you're, you know, first, there's that mindset shift that must happen. But if you had to describe maybe the first two or three steps after making that shift in mindset, what would that be? Well, what happens automatically is pretty quick. Everybody in the whole enterprise, physicians, mid-levels, janitors, executives, et cetera, et cetera, all realize that at the end of the day, everyone's eating out, if might be, may use a real crude term, living out of the same trough. And if at the end of the year, there's no water in the trough, everybody dehydrates. And so we're all aligned in the goal of getting the job done, keeping the population healthy within a, effectively a budget. It happens to be a prepayment could be a budget and have the same sort of impact, but all of a sudden everybody's aligned. And so all of a sudden light bulbs are going on. Well, is there a better way to do this? And maybe the primary care doctor should do this and not send it off to, you know, a specialist, or maybe we ought to have a home visit to avoid three ER visits and the like. All of that thinking quickly permeates the men mental states of everybody in within the enterprise. And so that's really the big answer, I think. You know, it, 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 it's so difficult because the data, I mean, even the records are not connected. My, my father was visiting my brother a couple of weeks ago in Texas. He's still there in Texas. So then they were supposed to come back. He was walking my brother's 90 pound puppy. He's got a, one of those, a, he's got a year old great Pyrenees. The leash was wrapped around my dad's wrist. Yeah. And his name is Comet. My dad was looking over at some deer and Comet darted off at a dog and literally tried, I mean, tried to drug, drug my father across the road and shattered my father's hip. Horrible situation. He's in San Antonio, Texas. We live in Tampa. And, uh, and this is the day he was supposed to come back. And you can imagine my father's in an emergency room in San Antonio. And he could have very well been in a tent in the middle of the jungle because they had no idea. Imagine the orthopedic on call has no idea about anything about his history his right. allergies and none of that and and so and he's in pain so they're asking him oh he's like yeah you know i had stents placed years ago and i'm a diabetic and all they're hearing is oh my gosh you know we got to do this workup right so he tells me he's a chen med patient i called his his doctor and i was in a panic and i told him i said oh dr Kiwala, my dad's in the hospital he broke his hip i'm worried they're going to delay the surgery and they don't know anything about him and i said do you have this and he said facile stop. I'm drawing a line here. Moving forward, you're the son, I'm the doctor. <laughs> and he got on the phone, called the hospital, got through to the on-call orthopedic, PDF, printed a PDF, my dad's last stress test, which was completely normal. His echocardiogram, totally normal. EKG, blood work, and medication list within a matter of like seven minutes, six, seven minutes. Yeah. But he was able to do that because he's efficient and we have this culture of, you know, delivering efficient care. But we're not there yet as a country. I mean, still, it's 2021 and you got to go through all this. If we would have asked for records, I was worried about somebody sending 700 pages of records to this orthopedic yeah. surgeon and it would have taken a couple of days to go through it and say, oh, forget it. Let's just do the whole workup. <laughs> what, what, do we, what do we need to do to make this system connected? Well, we need to organize it. Things organized work better than things disorganized. And so you guys were living examples of that. The payment model has a lot to do with that. So when all of a sudden some physicians are responsible for a population of say 50,000 patients, they got to get organized quick and that they do. And pretty soon you have an enterprise that's connected with, for example, an EMR, um, centralized data system, centralized care management system, et cetera, et cetera. It's positioned to talk and to share and everyone there works within the same medical record it may be on a computer screen so you have the ability 
to work together in a collegial team based way. Now, with, you know, a remote location, in Texas, you know, it may not be with a, another ChenMed site, but it may also be on an epic my chart system, for example, for all I know, or something let's hope interoperable and compatible and the press of ascend all of a sudden makes the, the records available or sends them. But things organize systems, systematic organized enterprises have a way of delivering care under these circumstances where with all due respect to Marcus Welby, I can't help but use him, you know, an individual doctor paid in a fee for service world on the corner, he's not going to be able to do that. And that won't be able to happen. And so organized systems, good payment model, good other things that come out of it also good. Could you imagine, could you imagine if, if uh, Marcus Welby had access to this, what, what he would have been able to do? He might have been able to do what he purports to do on TV. I mean, yeah. to be both, you know, a psychiatrist and a virologist and a public health guy and a counselor, you know, how did you need a cell phone to get all that done? That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, even just the, I mean, look at in the last 21 years that you've been involved. I mean, look at how, how notifications, I mean, even with something like ENS notifications, yeah. getting that type of real time data rather than hearing about it months later. I mean, we've definitely come a long way. Yeah, no, it's an explosion of technology is really, really a, a boon to American medicine. So I, I, we're going to rely heavily on it going forward to modernize our system. So I'm certainly a big believer in it. You, you've been passionate about making the transition from our fee-for-service healthcare model now for over 20 years, probably even longer. Yeah. Like what, 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 what were your initial challenges, you know, in the beginning? And now, like, where, where do you think we are now, especially with our elected officials? Well, I think the first verstand, the great, you know, epiphany was the waste. So it is now a convention, I think, conventional wisdom that some 35% of our spend, maybe 30, maybe 40, is quote unquote waste. So it's avoidable care. So as we look at that, take a snapshot of that, and then realize that our, you know, the trend line in terms of our spend is now, you know, 14. And when I first do it, started giving these talks by, so it was 12% per annum. I remember we got to 14 and we were blowing our minds and we're at 18, we're on our way. It looks inexorable on the way to 20 and 22. And, you know, the problem with that, of course, is the crowd out phenomenon. I mean, we're paying less for education and other social services, et cetera, et cetera, because of this quote unquote waste, the avoidable everything, care, admissions, care that deviates from what is, you know, known to be appropriate. And so, you know, with all that waste, we couldn't help but conclude quickly that it was basically the fee-for-service system that allowed for it because payment per click, fee-for-service incents more work, higher, you know, uh, intensity work, et cetera, et cetera, contrasted with a budget-based system where, you know, no one wants to waste any money and we have to circle back on how you prevent, you know, stinting on care, which is important, but the payment methodology. So you string this kind of little, you know, uh, uh, dialectic together and you realize the payment system will eliminate the waste, hopefully allowing more money for uh, in populations that need it and also make it available for, let's say, social care and social determinism. So it's all it's there for 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 the grabbing if we grab it. I mean, we can do this. We can because we do it in spots. And then there's Chris Proof. Chen Med is a great example of it. But I've got 335 members across the country. Most all of them are very good examples of it, frankly. So that was the epiphany. And then I've now lost the second part of your question, which is I think about political will and action in Congress. Yeah, like where, okay. where, where, well, I mean, it's wonderful. It's wonderful that that, I do believe that people, more and more people are understanding and believing that, especially now with the number one cause of bankruptcy yeah. being medical debt. I mean, who would have thought that, that that would be, and even one in five Americans being in some stage of debt collection now because of medical billing. I bet that has a lot to do with it too. But what, yeah. what, where, where do you think we are with our elected officials? So there's good news, mostly, I would say not so good news. The good news is that doing this now in 2021, when we go to Washington, D.C., and I'm speaking to some senator or congressman or staffs, they get most of what we're saying. I mean, you know, it used to be when we said, OK, fee for service, bad, capitation, good. They yeah. looked at us like we had two heads. What's capitation? You decapitate them or something. So anyway, but move forward in time, everybody gets it. 
I think now. So it's almost conventional wisdom. It's it's better. Even the staffers understand all the policy world understand directionally where we need to go. So that is the good news. And that's a big that's a that alone was a serious accomplishment. Now, however, though, you know, you get to this US Congress and with all due respect, it's highly divided for lots of reasons. Um, and then you get into the details of, you know, the electoral process. So, you know, the hot, you got a hospital in every small town throughout rural America. Uh, those congressmen are beholden to those, con those hospitals, whether we need them or not. So that tilts congressional thinking one way um so it's tough pushing a ball up the hill in terms of, of legislation regulation a little easier frankly in my opinion yeah. but that too depends on the administration and what's which way the wind's blowing this year or four years and so on i i am heartened by the private sector frankly i mean there's an awful lot of uh transformation that's just coming up from the bottom whether in its health plans or physician groups that are doing good things so there's a lot of sort of almost grassroots is probably the wrong word but transformation going on really by people of goodwill who can see before their eyes what needs to be done so you take the gestalt of that i'm actually pretty optimistic when i look at congress you know and all of a sudden they're adding vision and dental to original medicare to make it better why aren't they just helping medicare advantage which we all know to be better and you look at that and you go well, what, and that happened in the middle of the night. There wasn't even a discussion. So anyway, there are challenges. Uh, so um, there, Ajoy Kumar joined us this evening, and um, he's got an interesting question. Would like to know all your thoughts on recent study that reportedly showed that ACOs don't cut costs. Uh, so many models of care to transform care. Is there a one size fits all? And um, I just I wonder what your thoughts are yeah. about that. I think Fassel and I both have our thoughts as well. Well, so I think I may have read that very same article today, but it's one in a series. There's no question that Medicare ACOs, so whether it's the MSSP program or most of the alternative payment models, also known as APMs, developed by the Innovation Center, are on a fee-for-service chassis. All right. So the platform. So the incentive of the physicians participating in those models remains to do more, to get paid more. Pretty, pretty rational thinking, frankly. Uh, those networks are open networks, so the patients can go anywhere, anytime. They're not closed. They're not sort of, you know, forced, if that's the right word, to work within a network and work within a team. Um, there are issues relating to benchmarking and risk adjustment and the like. But in a word, I must say, based on our experience, the model is flawed. We see better models. Sometimes we see them in Medicare Advantage. Sometimes we see them in Medicaid and commercial. But you know, my organization's roots are in California, where you know uh, my members are doing very well across all of these products and programs. Okay, so indeed, Medicare ACOs not delivering the savings that they should, and it's a, because of flaws in the model where you've got the right models, you get great results. So that's my answer. Or, uh, you know, as a follow up to that, are you seeing that in your members that go, I mean, a lot of people, and I think even CMMI thought that the ACOs were the path to risk, right? You were gonna, that was the training wheels and you were gonna learn how to do it. But when it came to taking more risk, that was pretty difficult and, I know, uh, I think it was Sanjay Basu wrote in Health Affairs, I want to say back in 2017, showing that you had to, um, if you were taking less than 25% capitated, uh, you lost money. And until you weren't for sure to make money until you got over 60%. And so yep. somebody who's making their money in a fee-for-service model, try getting to 60% is a pretty huge lift. So people ask us when we go talk, how, what, you know, what should I do? What's the first step? I'm in, I'm in the fee for service model, maybe get some quality incentives. What is the next step and how do I move to this value-based care that you're talking about? So I might be a little radical on this one, but I'll just tell you my thought. It's very hard to argue against incremental improvement, right? 
through so much of life, we believe in training wheels. We did the use those with our kids. Who would, who would father would put his kid on a, That's right. you know, with, with some trainings. So they send baby steps before big steps often make sense. The problem here, though, is there is a sort of a tipping point, whether it's 25, 35 or 40 percent of the revenue is in risk. Unless you get to that tipping point, you're not committed enough to make it work. Once you get beyond the tipping point and you're facing some downside potential for downside losses, that concentrates the brain and all of a sudden, all of the aligned pieces come together and success ensues. So I must say, I am an advocate for stripping the Band-Aid off. In other words, there's a, the, the, the knowledge and know how to do it is there. So the pieces need to be put in place and I think that over a very short period of time, and I'm not talking 10 years, I'm talking about systems getting it done in two years. I'm talking about a medical wow. group in some cases doing it like overnight. Look what we did just for example, with telehealth, for example, I got done in a weekend and by most of my members and they had been working on it for two years. So things can be done far faster than we know and believe. And, you know, that bright policymakers and stuff can develop, you know, corridors and risk and stop loss and stuff to put in protections to prevent people from a complete fall. So I, I'm a believer in, you know, taking the jump. And I think once the jump is made, as long as the level of capitation is actuarially sound, um, there is a lot of good money to be made in taking good care of people. When you keep them well, you're going to get rich. <laughs> Shh, don't don't say that too loud, but it's just true. You keep it's, people it's, well now in the hospital. If that's part of it, you're you're going to do very well. It's 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 so much more of an ethical way to generate revenue in healthcare. Yeah. It's the most ethical way. You know, you're rewarded for for prevention and early intervention. I mean, it you turns know, a sick care system into a healthcare system. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So I used to, I used to be on a hospital board, and I can remember well, you know, the CFO of the hospital. I won't, of course, name them. The crying, oh no, you know, we didn't have a very good flu season this year, and our revenues are down, and we're hoping for a big flu next year. I mean, I mean, I'm listening to these words, and this is a, you know, got three or four advanced degrees, and you just, you shudder oh. to think, and so. Indeed, the ethics of it call for, you know, prepayment in order to keep people healthy. Where the focus is do whatever has to be done, whether it's address structural, you know, or institutional racism, whether it's flu season that requires some outreach, whether it's even social stuff like, you know, dietary, you know, nutritional insufficiency. Do whatever has got to be done to keep these people healthy and uh, their, you know, the, the, the profits will follow. You know. You, you said something just now that made me think. You said two years, you know, to transition. Like you could see it happening in two years. And when I, when I see like with your, your cardiology contracts, typically they're, they're not on salary. You know, they're, they have a guaranteed salary for, say, two years. And, and then they've got to, you know, they, to, to build up this RVU model. And then after two years is done, then you're just purely RVU based. Right. So essentially, for the first two years, the practice or the hospital or whatever is taking on all the risk with the revenue that's being generated by these cardiologists. Could we, could we, could we apply a similar concept with risk? That hey, you've got you've got two years to establish your your risk system, your risk model. Until then, you know we'll be taking on the risk, whoever we is. And we'll have the benchmarks and the tools to show you, hey, this is where you, this is what you need to do to get towards success. And then and then you're off on your way. Uh, the answer is, of course. So there's a fair amount of subcapitation in California for cardiology. And I don't know if it was done cold turkey or not, but I don't have any. There's any number clever business people can set up any number of safety nets and protection. So it could well be for the first two years we're going to pay on RVUs but we're going to measure you on capitation. And if at the end of the year, there would have been a savings under capitation, we'll split it with you or something like that. In other words, you, you, you can't go wrong for the first two years and we'll, but we'll get you on track to move into a full capitation or sub capitation on year three. So it's a safe way of doing it. And that can be done for sure. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, how, how would you, I know a lot of the hospital systems have not, 
invested in primary care. I guess that's probably the understatement of the century. Uh, but if you started capitating people in their areas, the simple fact is, is they don't have the primary care infrastructure because if you start, um, when you start attributing patients to them, you almost have to attribute it by primary care. And so you have a large health system that, you know, has a thousand physicians and, you know, 150 or 200 are primary care docs. Um, how are they going to, you know, how are they going to feed the beast? Even if you, yeah. I, I agree with you, you change the model of care, but we have to, we have to create the primary care access so that you will be able to attribute the patients. Well, you know, it's hard to know even where to start, but I mean, you know, the, we got to sort of face the facts that hospitals are remain wedded to a fee for service model in the main, it, particularly if we think of a DRG, which is fee for service, which it's not, but it does incent more admissions for the, the end price. We have hospitals, purchasing physicians and physician groups of all types, specialists and primary spoke. But very seldom do you see the real uh, watershed event, which is the enterprise sees the hospital as a cost center. And the day they do that, everything will change. So this very moment, I'm supposedly, I think tomorrow reviewing a kind of a white paper outline on um, that would provide basically guidance for systems to basically it's called the sort of the single trough uh, view. So if at the end of the year, all of the executives, those that ran the hospital or hospitals and all the those that ran the physician or physician groups, you know, earned their basically get to get the draw during the year. But then at the end of the year, there's true ups and so on. They get their bonuses based on how the entire enterprise did and not the hospital in a silo, nor the physician group in the file in a, in a silo. Then in that event, all of a sudden, for Stunt, you've got basically, you know, fully capitated system, and that would make sense. But it takes huge amounts of bravery, right, and courage, and you have to actually overcome one reality, which is given the payment systems right now, for most hospitals and hospital systems, fee for service ain't broke, and for most health plans, fee for service ain't broke, yeah. and so just because. Faisal and Don Crane have this great idea that, you know, prepayment makes the world better, a better place. They're going to go, well, you know, let's work on that in a few years. In other words, why change that which is not broke? And so it takes courage on their part, but it takes also policy, whether it's from health plans or from or, or legislative policy to create incentives, maybe even mandates, put thumbs on various sides of the scale to make this work and get it done. There has to be there has to be uh the will to do it but i but it can be done there are examples out there yeah. wow. do, do, do you think it would be possible to have a drg moment um i'm old enough to remember when they implemented drgs and i think it was september 30th and what 1983 that's about right we were on a cost plus basis and on october 1st okay, that's right medicare said it's going to be a drg basis and it didn't take long for everybody to figure out you had to get link the stays down and do all of that kind See? of those kind of things. I mean, could I, I know the politics are are iffy right now, but I mean, if they got together and I know that's a big if what, what would happen if there was a DRG moment saying we're now doing we're now going to pay for outcomes rather than pay for transactions. You know, it's these are immutable laws of economics, kind of as you saw in terms of the response to the DRG. Immediately, everybody went, ooh, long length to stay bad. Let's discharge them, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, the synapse is fired pretty quickly, you know, and I don't mean to be too flippant about it, but were a brave Congress and CMS to say, henceforth, we're going to cause hospitals to be capitated and nothing but, the behavior would change Im immediately uh that's what would happen that's what would happen and they could do fine you know there would be an awful lot of persuasion involved you would have to be fee-for-service equivalents we're going to get the same damn amount of money but we're going to give it to you in a single check at the outset and you've got it then you got the cash flow so you can build the infrastructure you need you can change out your staffing as you need you can do more in the way of nurses and case managers and care managers and outreach and pharmacists and psychologists you can spend your money any way you want to 
but you know you're going to get the same amount and and then they 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 need leaders that are brave to do that mm. you know i i presented earlier today at the ending burnout uh physician burnout global summit and my presentation was about creating culture and healthcare with the full risk model um do you think it's possible to have that in this transactional fee-for-service system? Well, if we're talking physician burnout, it's my view that a key reason for it is fee-for-service. I mean, so physicians got three kids about ready to go off to college and they need some more tuition money. What's he going to do? He's going to work more hours and see more patients and maybe work Saturday and do more and more. And this gives rise to the, you know, really unfortunate metaphor of a hamster wheel, which is a hell, hell of a way to be depicting physicians, frankly. But that's the nature of the beast. You've got to do more or more intensity. And, and uh, you know, and you, there's a close call as to whether, you know, this, the admission ought to be at home or not. Let's do it in the hospital, for God's sakes. And so burnout's a, number one relates to the, the, the payment model. Uh, there are other reasons, of course, associated with burnout. Sure, sure. I mean, when you're in an organized group and you've got a back office that's taking care of most of your problems and you're you're assigned a, a, a population and you're supervising a team, you know it should be gratifying. And you're working for the most complex patients, which is fun and interesting. And if you're not worried about every pay payable and checking on every code, you know you're gonna you're gonna have a happier existence. But that takes organized systems again, frankly. You know, I actually were. We're over a half an hour in. Uh, let's take, let's, let, can we use this time to take a quick 20 second commercial break and then we'll come back. I have got a couple more questions for Don Crane and we can wrap it up with some, some of his closing remarks. Great. Chimed honors seniors with affordable top of the line care and we're expanding. We're opening 25 new centers this year, including centers in two new cities, Houston and Detroit. Join us as we bring better health care to more seniors. Head to chenmed.com forward slash physicians for more information. And we're back. See, I told you, it'd only be 20 seconds. <laughs> so, so Don, the doctor-patient relationship, it used to be a sacred one uh, before it became this transactional one that most people are unfortunately familiar with today. Even the, trend, the language has become transactional. Doctors mm -hmm. are called providers, patients are clients, visits are encounters, I mean... It has just gone so far away from the relationship. How can we restore, like what are some steps? There are doctors who are in the fee-for-service. They want to take some steps right now, like safe steps towards value. Like if, you know, we're telling them, and I'm with you. You know, I agree. You know, you can't, you can't have doctors make the transition where they're still practicing in a system that's fee-for-service with these value-based sort of arrangements. I mean, the doctors don't know how to, <laughs> they can't separate. They just, it's a kind of like an all or nothing sort of thing. Yeah. But how can these good doctors and this tough system yeah. restore that sacred doctor-patient relationship? Well, well, well. So when they're in a team-based environment and all of a sudden they have a panel from 1,500 patients or 2,000 patients, it may be the case that the great majority of those are well cared for by the team, leaving only the sickest 250 to have a very deep relationship with the pay, with, with the physician. It's probably unrealistic to think there would be a tight patient physician relationship with the entire panel. But as you winnow it down to those patients that are in most need of care and leave the sprained ankles for the 25 year old football players and triathletes and stuff with the, the nurse practitioner, you just allocate basically skill sets more intelligently. And I think with that will come satisfaction and physicians will, you know, and there's, you know, I'll tell you, if you had a magic wand, very happy physicians do lots of good things. So somehow or other, maybe we ought to recast everything in terms of turning our physicians from, you know, being dissatisfied to highly satisfied. Lots of good things would flow from that. Um, but at any rate, I think it has to do again with basically organized systems and using the use of teams and the wise allocation of services skill sets you know the the you said earlier about the hospitals the hospitals are doing well right now you know many people are doing well in the system where's the incentive for them to transition i mean i was so excited about price transparency 
in the hospitals and those are prepared for, to see right. all this data come out. And it hasn't because it's che- it's cheaper to pay penalty. whatever penalty. Yeah, pay the penalty rather than <laughs> there's no incentive. It's like you gotta just, just make it. And actually just today, just today, Dr. Lee, I don't know if I told you this, but earlier today I was I was reading about the same hospital with the MR, MRI rates, three different MRI charges based on the insurance. One charge was like two thousand dollars. Yeah. Another one was over three thousand. There's like a third yeah. one charging five thousand for the same MRI, same yeah, cost. I know, well, I know. Like, like, so I mean, my suspicion is like it has something to do with yeah, like you know, it's it's just cheaper to keep paying the penalties. But I mean, <laughs> why do you think we don't have price transparency? Is it really is that what it is? Is it just so profitable that it's okay? Well, there's a bunch of factors. First off, they are very profitable and we're way too hospital centric, and that'll change in time because the science is pushing patients out into. Uh, the homes with remote monitoring, telehealth, yeah. and so yeah, on. Yeah. And so, uh, my well, I love my hospital yeah. friends, and so on. I think we're a hospital world is going to change automatically over time. the The opaque nature of the of the yeah. of the pricing and stuff is a part of function, basically, of such a such a um, what's a patchwork quilt, basically, of 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 cost shifting. Everything is shifting off. When, at the end of the day, the CFO's just got to make sure there's a 4% margin at the end of the line. If he's got to charge more to Humana and less to Aetna to get it done, maybe gouge an uninsured patient will get that done. But there's so much shifting and variability between all these that it creates this bizarre, you know, e- even if it were totally transparent, you know, and I'm on my way to the emergency room and back in the ambulance, you know, and go, well, no, no, don't take me there. Take me there because I've got it now and I just shifted from Blue Shield. Anyway, it has exposed really the, the uh, lunacy of cost shifting. And I'm going to start sounding like a single payer guy, but when you get multiple payers all using different fee schedules and contracts, this is what you get. This is why people in Canada prefer their system and people in France and Germany pr- pr- prefer theirs. So that's I think most of the answer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving that. <laughs> Sorry to depress you. <laughs> so can I, there's one more question I'd like to bring in if I could. Sure. Um, Dr. Joseph um, asked a question about what does the future of ACOs look like? And you had, you had mentioned a little bit, but what do you see the next iteration? I mean, what can people in the audience who are in the ACO world, where do you see the next step going with ACOs? Well, I wish I had a better answer. It's a little more clairvoyant. I mean, we really had a kind of an interesting tipping threshold point right now. The Medicare ACO program, as I've said, has not performed all that well, though it could be improved. The um, diving into the weeds a little bit, this issue that's hot on my desk right now is the what are known as direct contracted models. So in traditional Medicare, need for service, there are pilots that are um, uh, at work now that would uh, capitate ChenMed for seniors in traditional Medicare. So this isn't Medicare Advantage, but it would be capitated and it's in traditional Medicare where there's really so much waste. And that model could and should thrive and be really the stepping stone to much more capitation and good things. It has, however, been halted by CMMI for reasons that I don't fully understand. There are There's opposition to it. There's concerns about Trojan horse health plans and turning it into a Medicare advantage and then upcoding in an unfair way and, and so on. And some of those concerns are legitimate, but those are also rectifiable with some sensible regulation writing and so on. I mean, we could deal with it this afternoon if we really wanted to. But anyway, I, I dwell on this one because it's not impossible that the you know CMS, the administration, and Congress make mistakes. So the question is, you know, what's the future ACOs? And I'd like to say, oh, their cream floats to the top. It's utterly inevitable that they will succeed, and we will have a beautiful world of nothing but accountable care across the the, the country. I'm not convinced that's the case. Um, at the moment, it's the movement to value while happening feels inexorable, but it's too slow. It is yeah. too slow. No great idea can move this slow. It's just going to get picked off and killed in some fashion. In the meantime, the costs rise so much. So, you know, the thing that wakes me up in the middle of the night now is a Congress 
fast becoming, you know, impoverished and bankrupting the trust funds and the like, just turns to crude, blunt cut sequester is the fancy word they use in the Medicare parlance, but they simply chop five, chop 10% out of physician pay and just starve the system into affordability. You got to get to affordability and there's ways to do it. And there's some that are not very uh, pleasant and others that are. So I worry about the ACO sort of movement and the legs it's on right now. So I don't know, maybe did I talk around that question enough to give you an answer? I guess I did. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, you know, the ACO, uh, the way I heard somebody describe it once, the best you ever get is what half of what you would have gotten otherwise from the hospital system. So mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult to move forward with that. But um, yeah, it's, I, I, I think we would agree with you. Things seem to be moving incredibly slowly and one out of five dollars in the economy is being spent on health care. One out of five Americans is in some form of medical debt collection. Um, it's, I mean, it's hitting really close to home for most people at this point. And mm -hmm. how do we, how do we make the change to value and actually start, start watching the cost go down instead of continuing to go up and crash? Yep. Yep. I mean, that's the $64 question. I think it's going to take will. We probably ought to pay a little more attention. What are they doing in Germany and France and the Netherlands is working so damn well and probably ought to go ahead and imitate just a little bit more. You'll find at the end of the day, it'll be, there'll be variety, but it's physician group centric somehow. They may have health plans. They may employ doctors. They may not. Um, there may be, you know, one fee schedule for the whole damn country, whatever. But at the heart of it will be organized physician groups. I mean, that's what counts. And uh, we, need, we need to get there. I, and I, I, you know, I love all my physician friends. I, I'm a little concerned about the profession becoming employed by hospitals and health plans. I don't really want to trade away the sort of majesty of the profession. Frankly, I'd rather uh, work hard to claim our kind of rightful place in the hierarchy. I'm biased. Yeah, well, well, I mean, I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, the physicians traditionally have watched out for what's best for the patient. So taking the leadership and in some ways we've abdicated that when we've said, OK, the you know, the hospital administrator was going to take care of all the staffing and all the billing and we're just going to show up and and do the health care. And ultimately, I mean, we're seeing more and more that the money does drive outcomes and you can't ignore the the money when you're taking care of the patient because yep. they need that money to buy food and pay for rent. And sure. we, we just can't take it all. We need to educate our kids. We just we can't take all the money for health care. Yep. Agreed. I agree. Oh, well, Don Crane, Dr. Dan, Dr. Dan, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation tonight. Pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and to our audience. Thank you for your questions. Good questions. Good conversations. Fun working with you guys. Smart people. I like it. Very gratifying. <laughs> time, the time went by. We, prom we promised a <laughs> half an hour. We're over 40 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. For more information about tonight's topic and to explore career opportunities with ChenMed, remember, we're on track to open another four to 500 centers in the next four to five years. And you're talking 500 centers, you're talking four, four doctors for each center, four, four to six doctors, you know, two, 3,000 doctors, plus all the staff and the support that those doctors need. We're hiring. We're growing across the country. Please visit ChenMed.com if you're interested in learning about a completely different way of practicing medicine. We believe access to primary care is a right, not a privilege. <laughs>